and welcome to Western Civ, episode 200, The Institutes of the Christian Religion. Well, episode 200. Can't say I ever expected to see it. When I started this nearly eight years ago in ancient Mesopotamia, it seemed like it might last a year or two. But now I can confidently say that I have every intention of taking this story to its conclusion. And ladies and gentlemen, we've got a long way to go. Anyway, speaking of a long way to go, last time we left John Calvin traveling south to the Swiss city of Basel. Basel was one of the powerful cities of the Swiss Confederation, including Zurich and Bern, which we already met during our episodes on Zwingli. The Swiss cities were already established havens for religious dissidents, which is precisely why Calvin was making his way there. Though, as a Frenchman, it would still be in the Swiss cities that Calvin would truly make a name for himself. Calvin's journey to Basel was not without its troubles. It was, after all, still the 16th century. Heck, near the town of Metz, he was robbed by one of his servants, and only able to continue after a different one of his servants loaned him the cash. Not exactly an auspicious start. For a young man eager to pursue a literary career, there was every reason to choose Basel, though Calvin himself derided it as a, quote, obscure corner, end quote. Basel had strong links to France and the evangelical cause. In the wake of the disastrous Placards Affair, many implicated nobles sought protection in this Swiss city on the Rhine. Basel today is the third largest city in Switzerland. It is located on the River Rhine in northwestern Switzerland, about 40 miles west of Zurich. It is only 80 miles down the Rhine from Strasbourg. It might have offered Calvin some protections, but it was far from a walled-off paradise. Basil only accepted the Reformation five years earlier, in 1529, and unresolved tensions abounded. It was also the city of Erasmus, though he took little part in public affairs and definitely did not accept the new religion. Interestingly, also in resident at Basel at the time was Andreas Karlstadt, Luther's old friend turned nemesis. Hence, in terms of humanism and theology, Basil already sported its share of heavy hitters. Certainly a major attraction for Calvin was Basil's printing industry. It was already associated with printing even before the Reformation and had long been known as a Bible-printing powerhouse. For a brief period in the late 1520s, Basil had been the center of French evangelical printing, though that by and large fizzled out by the close of the decade. The linchpin of the Basil intellectual world was Simeon Grineus, who had returned from a Lutheran university in the summer of 1535 and gathered around him most of the prominent French students in the city. Calvin would meet Karlstad and Grineus while in Basel, but never Erasmus, who had returned to the city in 1535 
a very ill man. Basil was Calvin's first glimpse of a Protestant state, though he would not not have understood any of the German services, not speaking German himself. While immersed in the Protestant world, however, Calvin continued to receive disturbing news from France as more and more exiles flowed into and through the city. According to these men, the Catholics were trumping up all kinds of malicious gossip to get every suspected Protestant they could arrested. These reports encouraged Calvin to write The Institutes, along with a major dedication to the French king, Francis I. From Basel, Calvin could also look out toward the Protestant German-speaking lands and watch as the conflict over the Lord's Supper tore any semblance of unity apart. Luther believed that Christ was really present in the Eucharist, while Zwingli and the other sacramentarians, not a term they would have used for themselves, but one derisively used to label them by their opponents, believed that the Lord's Supper was purely symbolic. The real casualty in all of this was the unity of the Protestant princes and cities against the Catholic Emperor Charles V. Calvin now got to witness firsthand the results of this self-destructive disunity. The divisions between the Zwinglians and the Lutherans would haunt him over the next two decades as he sought to break the impasse. Like Martin Bucher, Calvin firmly believed that reconciliation was possible if both sides wanted it. But at least so long as Martin Luther lived, that was not possible. In many ways, Calvin found exactly what he wanted in Basel, a place to write and study. By the autumn of 1535, he had finished his seminal work, The Institutes of the Christian Religion, a work he would continue to edit and release new editions of until his death nearly 27 years later. The text did not appear in print, until the spring of 1536. It was a brilliant work of theological scholarship and simply groundbreaking for someone who had never formally studied theology. At last, Protestantism's strongest writer, strongest advocate, had emerged. Calvin came onto the scene as a writer at precisely the same time that the French language was starting to codify. This was a time of extraordinary creativity in which John Calvin would play a leading role. Given that, let's dig into the Institutes of the Christian Religion and determine why it was so important to the development of Protestant theology. One of the most important themes in the work is the concept of humanity's relationship to the divine. Humanity, Calvin writes, was created in God's image. Yet, in exercising free will, it chooses sin time and time again. Nevertheless, While humankind may have rejected God, God has not turned against creation, which abounds with signs of the divine presence. Faith, then, is what makes God's covenant with humankind real. God's first pact with man was with the Israelites, but they turned from him, and so God made a second alliance with man through Jesus Christ. Calvin wrote that Christ was the fulfillment of the promise that God made to Abraham. This was a new and everlasting covenant 
signed, and sealed with Christ's death on the cross. Man might turn from God, Calvin hypothesized, but God's promise never failed. Calvin's God is intimate, dwelling as it were in multiple figures of the Old Testament. This is a significant shift for Calvin. No longer did he believe the stoic ideal that God was a distant, remote figure. Divinity was in Scripture. It was right here, right now. For Calvin, God was both near and comforting. This is a sharp contrast to Luther's distant and inherently unknowable God. Certainly, the Institutes was Calvin's greatest achievement of his time in Basel. He intended it both as an apology for the Reformed faith in France and as a tool of the instruction in the essentials of true piety. And it was six chapters long. To an extent, his plan was also to prove the falsity of the French Catholic claim that Reformed Christians were either Anabaptists or seditious traitors. The term that he used for the title Institutio, Latin, or Institute in English, is important in and of itself. While later versions of the work were intended as a comprehensive treatment of the Christian religion, the first one wasn't. As an Institutio or Institute, it was intended primarily as a practical book of instruction, as a catechism or summary of the major tenets of the faith. No sooner did Calvin finish the work that he began working on revisions that would, one day, culminate in the final 1559 edition, which remains the standard to this day. Calvin, the gifted writer and humanist, really came into his own when he wrote the Institutes, and that is part of its importance. Never before had anyone, in such concise and beautiful prose, argued so effectively for Reformed Christianity. Luther was well known in Germany, but outside the empire, his works were not translated out of Latin. It was John Calvin who brought Reformed Christianity to the rest of Europe. One of his most important passages concerned the question of authority, one of the major sticking points between Reformed Christianity and Catholicism. The early church fathers, he assured his readers, were not a firm foundation for the teachings of the Roman church. After all, just because a practice had become a custom in the church, that did not mean it was divinely sanctioned. Quote, Now then, let our adversaries throw at us many examples as they wish, both of past and present ages. If we hallow the Lord of hosts, we shall not be greatly afraid. Even though many ages have agreed in impiety that the Lord is strong to wreak vengeance, even to the third and fourth generation. Even though the whole world may conspire in the same wickedness, he has taught us by experience what is the end of those who sin with the multitude. End quote. The true church is not the visible institution in Rome. It is the preaching and hearing of God's word. In response to the charge faced by all reformers that their doctrines were the source of social and political upheaval, Calvin offered a fairly standard reply, quoting 1 Kings verse 18. Elijah taught us what we ought to reply to such charges. It is not we who either spread errors abroad or incite tumults. It is they who contend against God's power. In other words, not all reformers were the Anabaptists. 
Those who truly follow the gospel, wrote Calvin, are utterly loyal to the monarch. We are unjustly charged, too, with intentions of a sort, as we have never given the least suspicion. We are, I suppose, contriving the overthrow of kingdoms. We, from whom not one seditious word was ever heard. We, whose life when we lived under you was always acknowledged to be quiet and simple. We, who do not cease to pray for the full prosperity of yourself and your kingdom, although we are now fugitives from home. We are, I suppose, wildly chasing after wanton vices. Even though in our moral actions, many things are blameworthy, nothing deserves such reproach as this. Attached to the first edition was a lengthy dedication to Francis I. In many ways, Calvin sought to play the role of Seneca to Francis as though he were Nero. He wanted Francis to understand that he hadn't written this book for personal gain. Do not think that I am here preparing my own defense, thereby to return safely to my native land. Even though I regard my country with as much natural affection as becomes me, as things stand now, I do not much regret being excluded. Rather, I embrace the common cause of all believers, that of Christ himself, a cause completely torn and trampled in your kingdom today, lying, as it were, utterly forlorn, more through the tyranny of certain Pharisees than with your approval. Still, the Institutes were not written as devotional literature. They were for the people of the Church. There are certainly elements of both Luther and Zwingli in the Institutes, though Calvin by no means lifts any large chunks of their theology and just plops it down. Faith and the sacraments within it are intricately bound together. And in the final part of the Institutes, Calvin treats the subjects for which he would become most well-known, the freedom of a Christian and the political and church authority. In terms of the first concept, he echoes Luther, Freedom meant freedom to obey God without compulsion. The crucial distinction here is to know what is sanctioned by God and what is not. Baptism is. Last rites is not. Temporal authority is properly vested in lay rulers, so long as they avoid tyranny and excesses. God has charged these men with the maintenance of the state and they must not fail in their abilities. Christians need a firm hand in their civil government, because the elect and the damned live side by side. The magistrates must rule over both without distinction. The goal of the Institutes was not merely to teach, but to convince. And to that end, it was crafted very much like a legal argument. I suppose... In the end, the Institutes matter historically because they became so popular. Calvin sold almost none of his commentaries on Seneca. But the Institutes of the Christian religion? That flew off the printing press. In March of 1536, Calvin traveled to visit the court of René of Ferrara. The daughter of Louis XII Rene was religiously tolerant, and her court had become something of a refuge for French religious dissidents. Her husband, however, was implacably opposed to the Reformed faith. Being in Ferrara exposed Calvin to the kind of religious tug-of-war that was going on throughout noble courts in Europe in the mid-16th century. Genuine religious conviction, often mixed in these cases, with real politique. It was a difficult balancing act and something that Calvin would have to get accustomed to. Now, something similar was happening at the same time in France. There, the Edict of Cossy in July of 1535 
allowed any French dissident exiles to return to the kingdom in the condition that they renounced their quote-unquote heresy within six months. Calvin, ironically, returned to France during this period, though he renounced nothing. Instead, he used the time to conclude some family business before returning to the Swiss Confederation. He did not know it at the time, but this would be his final visit to the kingdom of his birth. He would never see France again. During this trip, Calvin met the influential and charismatic preacher Guillaume Farrell. The two men would ultimately work together until Calvin's death 27 years later, forming a friendship that would endure for nearly three centuries and a partnership that would build the Reformed Church. Calvin described Farrell as follows. Farrell, who burned with an extraordinary zeal to advance the gospel, immediately strained every nerve to detain me, Calvin, and after having learned that my heart was set on devoting myself to private studies, for which I wished to keep myself free from other pursuits, and finding that he gained nothing by entreaties, he proceeded to utter a threat that God would curse my retirement and tranquility of my studies, which I sought, if I should withdraw and refuse to give assistance when the necessity was so urgent. I was struck with fear by this threat that I desisted from the journey which I had undertaken, but mindful of my natural bashfulness and timidity, I would not bring myself under any obligation to discharge any particular office. Farrell had already made a name for himself in the Reformation, having moved to Geneva in 1532, where he was decisive in moving that city toward the Reformed Church. Geneva, previously under the political hold of the Duke of Savoy in southeastern France, came under the protection of Bern after their army ousted the Duke and his forces. Geneva was permitted autonomy, though dependent on Bern militarily and politically. In contrast to cities like Zurich and the aforementioned Bern, Geneva had a very small hinterland, making it difficult to recruit soldiers and politically dependent on Bern. The imposition of the Reformed faith in Geneva began in 1536, shortly after Calvin arrived in the city. Even then, initially, the Reformed Church in Geneva was Reformed in name only. It was one thing to declare the Reformed Church in power, but another to make people adopt the changes. The Reformed made up a tiny fraction of the population in Geneva early on. Ministers still continued to dress as priests. Very few lay people brought their children to any Reformed Church for baptism, and Catholic prayers continued to be said in a Reformed Church outside regular hours of worship. Geneva is an interesting example of how the Reformation could be driven by non-religious factors. It was a modest-sized city in 1530, with around 12,000 inhabitants, almost all of whom lived within the city walls. Once the House of Savoy was driven from the territory, the magistrates of the city still had to deal with the old clergy, who were still loyal to Savoy and seen by many as foreigners. Beginning in the early 1530s, the magistrates in Geneva began following a systematic policy of confiscating the wealth and land of the remaining Catholic outpost in Geneva. This root and branch restructuring of the city meant changing every aspect of life, from politics and economics all the way to religion. French replaced Latin as the official language in Geneva's records. Geneva's new government then resembled a closely guarded republic that was, frankly, plutocratic. <laughs> 
in many ways. There was a small council that managed most of the affairs of the city, presided over by four magistrates called syndics. All the most important decisions in the city went through the small council. The largest governing body in Geneva was the General Assembly, which included all heads of household and met four times per year. The Genevans might have ousted Savoy, but it was not an idyllic paradise. Factionalism within Geneva, between those who wanted closer relations with the Swiss Confederation and those conservative elements who still supported Savoy, was constant. When Guillaume Farrell arrived in the city in 1532, he immediately allied himself with the Republicans, sensing an opportunity to push Geneva toward Reformed theology. Still, the first official Reformed worship service was not held in the city until Good Friday, 1533. In January 1534, the city held a disputation to determine, formerly, how to proceed. The Reformed Party won a striking victory, and the local Catholic bishop left the city shortly thereafter. In May 1535, the Mass was abolished, and in the spring of 1536, the new faith adopted by formal edict. It might seem odd at first blush that Calvin decided to make his home in Geneva, torn by internal strife, rather than Basel, where he was already becoming established. The only reason that Calvin gives us for his decision to choose Geneva over Basel is the divine hand of providence. And I'm afraid we must take him at his word. At first, Calvin was only in Geneva as a teacher. But in early 1537, he began taking baby steps toward preaching, though we do know he was never ordained. Soon he was preaching regularly on Sundays, as well as during the week. But Farrell, not Calvin, was the one in charge at this point. From 1536 onward, he instituted what he called congregations, whose purpose was to bring together members of the community with a learned preacher for both education and worship. Quickly, these congregations became a way to effectively distribute Reformed doctrine. But the fight was far from over. Disastrously, in the nearby town of Lusignan, Bernese officials decided to appoint Pierre Caroli, chief preacher, over one of Farrell and Calvin's allies. Caroli was not a Reformed preacher, and his acceptance of prayers for the dead quickly brought him into conflict with the Reformed Party, who jumped all over him. Caroli responded, accusing Farrell and Calvin of Arianism, in, I guess, kind of a super throwback insult, you might remember. Arianism from, I don't know, like circa 5th and 6th centuries CE? Well... I guess you can still bandy that one about when needed. In February 1537, Calvin wrote to Bullinger, Zwingli's successor in Zurich, accusing Caroli of being a quote-unquote ambitious man, considered a term of derision at the time. In May, a disputation cleared Farrell and Calvin of any wrongdoing and dismissed Caroli who adamantly refused to admit that his accusations had been wrong. Caroli eventually fled the city in the dead of night, leaving Calvin in the clear. Still, what the incident taught John Calvin in 
was that he needed firmer lines of communication with the other Swiss churches. This sort of thing could not be allowed to happen again. Moreover, because of the relative inadequacy of Geneva's military, Calvin was, sadly, dependent on Bern and the other city-states of the Swiss Confederation to an extent. He realized, therefore, if enemies were allowed to flourish in these other cities, then that could spell doom as well for Calvin. And of course, problematically, Bern was currently in the midst of its own religious chaos. Its chief minister remained ardently Zwingli in his theology, but recently the influence of former Lutheran Martin Bucer had grown in the city. And Bucer's theology was not Zwinglian, he being much closer to Martin Luther in Germany. For much of 1537, the city was torn apart by bitter conflicts. In early 1538, Calvin, rather unwisely, began firing off public letters intervening in the dispute against Bucer. This incident reveals something about Calvin. Always confident that he was the smartest person in the room, Calvin would unleash his icy wit on those he felt incorrect and unintelligent. The only question was, would he have to pay for it? It was a question that would be repeated throughout his life. Calvin's first major piece of writing after the Institutes were a series of public letters in 1537 that were nothing more than vicious and very personal attacks on his theological enemies. The letters were addressed to two Paris ministers, who he once held in high regard, but he now loathed with the passion of a thousand burning suns. The letters are important because they demonstrate Calvin's intense desire to break with the Roman church. Listen here to how he describes the most important institution of the Middle Ages. The Roman church is that Egypt where so many monsters, idols, and idolatries are found, and where detestable sacrileges, pollution, and filthiness swarm. There is only one way to escape pollution. That way is to resist its beginnings and never contemplate it. For if we allow ourselves to contemplate it, we have already passed over its boundaries. True piety engenders true confession. Christians, he argued, could not remain in the Roman church if they wanted to be true Christians. Quote, those who give or receive by the very act to prove and consent to the detestable evil, the vulgar and common excuse that it is necessary to appease the rage of the priests, and that this can be done with a piece of money, great or small, it is like the argument of one who throws a morsel of meat into the mouth of a dangerous beast. End quote. Locally, Calvin was having more success. In 1537, the Reform Party won a convincing victory in the local election. The biggest decision facing the small council that year was whether or not to accept Calvin and Farrell's insistence that everyone, everyone, within Geneva's walls swear an oath of allegiance to the Reformed faith. The council agreed in principle, but then they balked when Farrell and Calvin also demanded that anybody who didn't swear the oath be excommunicated, which would be tantamount to being banished. Not everyone in Geneva was happy about this idea. Not by a long shot. Don't forget, John Calvin is a foreigner. He's a Frenchman. 
and many Genevans were not pleased at the thought of having to swear an oath of allegiance crafted by a bunch of Frenchmen. The council determined it simply could not excommunicate, i.e. exile, the members of powerful noble families who would not take the oath, causing Calvin to write gloomily to Bollinger. We have not been able to ensure that the faithful and holy exercise of ecclesiastical excommunication is rescued from the oblivion into which it has fallen, and that the city, which in proportion to its size is very populous, is divided into parishes and is made necessary by the complicated administration of the church. In 1538, the council elections returned a small council much less favorable to Calvin. And now the debate shifted from whether to require that oath to whether to adopt a Bernese liturgy. Things went from bad to worse. When Farrell suggested a policy whereby Geneva might ally itself closer to France, all six council members who supported the idea were summarily removed from the council. Shortly thereafter, Calvin and Farrell were summoned before the council and bluntly informed that their continued participation in the church was contingent on their accepting the Bernese liturgy. It hardly mattered. By now, the two men barely represented the church. Banned from preaching in the cathedral, they met generally at Calvin's house or in his school. Calvin refused to back down, however. He and Farrell declared that not only would they refuse to use the Bernese liturgy, but if pressed, they would excommunicate the entire city. Farrell's supporters then became increasingly violent, and both men made good on their threat, refusing communion to all of Geneva. But the council had made up its mind. It adopted the Bernese liturgy and ordered Calvin and Farrell to leave Geneva immediately. Knowing that their days were numbered, the two men departed for Zurich. On the way to Zurich, Calvin and Farrell stopped off at Bern, where they attempted to give the city council their version of what happened in Geneva before the official one arrived. It was a bad decision. Calvin and Farrell lied claiming that they had accepted the Bernese liturgy and had been kicked out of the city as the result of a conspiracy against them perpetuated by France. Literally, none of that made any sense, and when the official report arrived from Geneva, Calvin was quick to discover that most people saw him as the problem in the whole affair, not the victim. Most people in the Swiss Confederation felt Calvin and Farrell had weakened the church by bringing disorder to it. Even men like Bucer had to concede that, at the very least, Calvin had acted out of an excess of zeal. Calvin, in his writings at the time, was quick to express how much he had been traumatized by what had transpired, writing, Above all, however, on looking back and considering the perplexities which surrounded me from the first time I went there, Geneva. There is nothing I dread more than returning to the charge from which I have been set free. For though when I first took it up, I could discern the calling of God, which held me fast, and by which I consoled myself now. Now, on the contrary, I am in fear that I would tempt him if I were to resume so great a burden which I have already felt to be insupportable. His confidence shaken, Calvin simply drifted about without any real sense of purpose, moving between Basel and Strasbourg. Bucer suggested that Calvin and Farrell separate, 
as the two men were clearly negative influences on one another. Calvin agreed, but at this point he was mentally and physically shattered. And most betting men probably would have guessed that in 1538, history had heard the last of John Calvin. But his three years spent in Strasbourg changed him. Had Providence not led John Calvin to that city in 1538, it seems extremely likely that he would have become yet another footnote to history. Above all others, one man was responsible for that not happening. Martin Bucer. Bucer was the Martin Luther of southern Germany. He was far more influential than anyone else in the southwestern corner of the empire. He had successfully steered southern Germany away from Zwingli and toward Lutheranism in the form of the Wittenberg Concord. Strasbourg had a lot to offer John Calvin, including Bucher, plus the opportunity to study and write. By the time Calvin left Strasbourg, he was a well-known author and the leader, an expelled leader, but a leader nonetheless, of his own church. To be fair, while Bucher invited Calvin to Strasbourg, he had no immediate purpose for him there. He was not needed to fill any important post. Calvin, Calvin was there to learn how to be a pastor so that he could return to Geneva someday and reclaim his flock. Calvin watched his mentor deal with the magistrates in Strasbourg, struggling with some of the same issues that bedeviled Calvin in Geneva. Calvin began to realize that he needed to strike more of a balance between the power of the church and the power of the magistrates. Calvin had always been highly disciplined, and a hard worker. But it's one thing to spend hours at study and writing, and another when you had to work with actual human beings. Now, for the first time really in his life, Calvin learned what it meant to work in a church. It's worth pointing out that of the three early reformers, Luther, Zwingli, and Calvin. All but Calvin had prior ecclesiastical experience. Luther had been a monk, Zwingli a priest. Calvin had only studied law and written. His system was rigid to the end, which made sense at this point, given that it's entirely based on theory. Also in Strasbourg, Calvin broached the subject of marriage for the first time. Like all clerical reformers, Calvin strongly advocated for priests to get married, or at least have the right to. But there's no evidence that he sought a wife prior to 1539, writing, I am not one of those insane kind of lovers who, once smitten by the first glance of a fine figure, cherishes even the faults of his lover. The only beauty that seduces me is of the one who is chaste, not too fastidious, modest, thrifty, patient, and hopefully she will be attentive to my health. And if that doesn't fit the image of what we think of when we think of John Calvin, I don't know what does. However, by the summer of 1540, he met and married a woman with whom he seems to have shared a genuine relationship, Idolette de Bure. Some biographers, mostly Catholics, writing about Calvin after his death, suggest that his marriage was purely platonic and devoid of any real emotional connection. There really is not any evidence to support this slander. Calvin wrote consistently throughout his life about the importance of sex in a marriage. There are references to Calvin having and then losing a son. There may have been daughters as well, but none survived. It was still the 16th century, after all. 
and death was a commonplace companion of the young. But Boucher was the most important influence on Calvin during these years, not his wife. Calvin believed that Boucher was the best of the Reformed theologians, writing, endowed as indeed he is, with a singularly acute and remarkably clear judgment, there is at the same time no one who is more religiously desirous to keep with the simplicity of the word of God and less given to hunt after the niceties of the interpretation that are foreign to it. Certainly, Bucer pushed Calvin to be a better administrator and deepen his own theology. When Calvin returned to Geneva, he would build his church around this model, which adhered itself to the teachings of the very early Christian communities in the three centuries after the life of Christ. Bucer put himself out there for Calvin in every way possible. He introduced him to his friends, gave him place to study. He even provided him with a little house and a garden that adjoined his own so that the two men could talk whenever needed. He was, in every sense of the word, Calvin's most important mentor. Bucer was almost a father figure to Calvin. When he died in exile in 1551 in England, Farrell wrote about Calvin's reaction as follows. I have received Pius Bucher's last letter. What a heart. What a man has gone. We must rejoice in our sorrow that a man so fond of us has journeyed to God. I have no doubt that after his journey, he commanded us to God. How rightly he thought of you and how justly he loved you. Needless to say, the two men enjoyed a very close friendship. The big writing project for Calvin, while in Strasbourg, was his 1539 revision of his 1536 Institutes of the Christian Religion. Truth be told, as I mentioned at the beginning, Calvin likely began brainstorming how to revise his first draft the moment he finished the first one. Certainly, by 1539, he had come to the conclusion that the 1536 Institutes no longer sufficiently captured his complete theology. In addition, while the 1536 book was mostly a catechism, a summary of doctrine, the 1539 version was much deeper and more of an instruction manual for future preachers. Quote, it has been my purpose in this labor to prepare and instruct candidates in sacred theology for the reading of the divine word, in order that they may be able both to have easy access to it and to advance in it without stumbling. For I believe I have so embraced the sum of religion in all its parts and have arranged it in such an order that if anyone rightly grasps it, it will not be difficult for him to determine what he ought especially to seek in Scripture, and to what end he ought to relate its contents. If after this road has, as it were, been paved, I shall publish any detailed exposition of Scripture. I shall always condense them, because I shall have had no need to undertake long doctrinal disputations, or to wander about in the basic topics. End quote. This time, the greatest external influence for the revisions was actually theologian Philip Melanchthon, who Calvin still regarded as one of the finest theologians of the day. Of course, Geneva weighed on Calvin's mind all while he wrote and revised. What had gone wrong? What could he change? To Bucer and most of the other nearby reformers, the answer was fairly obvious. Calvin. John Calvin had gone wrong. John Calvin had to change. Specifically, his haughty inflexibility doomed the experiment from the very beginning. Sure, everyone conceded that the true gospel needed to be preached— 
but at the same time, everyone needed to work with lay authorities. These were men who had concerns beyond the walls of the church. The gospel might be clear as day, sure, but modern politics? Anything but. Bücher never suggested that Calvin compromise on the truth. But he did suggest that there might be times that he would need to compromise in the moment to save the project as a whole. The magistrates might have weaker dispositions than him, but Calvin had to recognize that they wielded the power. Calvin wrote a few revealing letters at the time. It is quite clear to my own satisfaction you do well to admonish me not to confide too much in one's own understanding, for I know my range to be such that I cannot presume even so little upon myself without exceeding. I know well enough that foolish ambition might hoodwink me so as to deflect the straightforwardness of my judgment. For John Calvin, this was as close as he would ever come to admitting he was wrong. And while Calvin might be expelled from Geneva, he never turned his back on it. All the while in Strasbourg, he kept one ear to the ground, listening for news from his former city. He always planned to go back. Bucer always planned for him to go back. Strasbourg was a temporary situation. And back in Geneva, things were not all roses and sunshine. Factionalism was still the order of the day, and the prevailing question continued to be the nature of Geneva's relationship with Bern. Should Geneva renew its treaty with its powerful neighbor and effectively cede its ability to chart its own religious course? There were some in the city who argued that it had to in order to benefit from Bern's military support. Others suggested it wasn't worth it, especially if Geneva wasn't going to have autonomy either way. Into the fray stepped John Calvin. He wrote an open letter to Geneva, claiming that the only way forward was to fully accept a restoration of his Christian ministry. Quote, For he, God, not only commands us to be willingly obedient with fear and trembling to the world, while it is proclaimed to us. But he also commands that ministers of the word be treated with honor and reverence, for they are addressed as his ambassadors, whom he would have us acknowledge as his angels and messengers. End quote. He ended his letter with a warning. If the Genevans did not accept his teaching, then they were condemning themselves to eternal fighting. There is some truth to Calvin's argument. A firm state-sponsored church certainly would bring the end to discussion and debate, debate that occasionally turned violent. Such is always the allure of some form of authoritarianism. The desire for peace over freedom. As Calvin was writing to the church in Geneva, he also began an open correspondence with Cardinal Sodaletto of the Catholic Church. Sodaletto was a very unique figure during this period because he was one of the few willing to have open debates about issues concerning theology. That Calvin would engage with him indicates both Calvin's ongoing theological evolution and increasing notoriety as a writer and theologian. This respected man might be a man with authority. This might be someone Geneva needs right now. Calvin, in his open letter to Sadaletto, argued that faith was never about individual salvation. That was where the Catholic Church had it all wrong. It was about the glory of God. Scripture indicates clearly that no matter what, some people, though they might err, walk the path of salvation. Calvin wrote, I had indeed learned to worship you as my God, but as the true method of worshiping was entirely unknown to me, I stumble at the very threshold. <laughs>
I believed, as I had been taught, that I was redeemed by the death of your Son from liability to eternal death, that the redemption I thought of was one whose virtue could never reach me. I anticipated a full resurrection, but I hated to think of it as being almost too dreadful. Life is uncertain, but one thing man can be certain of are God's promises. Before returning to Geneva, Calvin went with Bucer to the Leipzig Disputation in January 1539, and then to the Imperial Diet six weeks later. We talked about this both during the episodes on Martin Luther and Zwingli, but this was another one of Bucer's efforts to find common ground between the Sacramentarians in Zurich and the Lutherans in northern Germany. While Calvin found the prospect of the proposed agreement acceptable, we know, of course, that nothing will come of it, and that the Schmaldic League will soon be defeated by the emperor. Still, it is important to note that Calvin ardently worked with the Lutherans in Germany. He never saw minor doctrinal distinctions over how one treated the Lord's Supper, for example, as reasons to dismiss fellow Protestants. Unlike Zwingli and Luther, Calvin recognized that everyone could acknowledge small differences, but still band together to fight Catholicism. When the two sides met at Worms, Calvin was seated next to several important German princes, indicating both that Bucer did not see him as a sacramentarian and that he had significant enough stature to warrant being seated next to important people. Calvin spoke several times during the meeting and argued effectively that all Protestants saw God's grace as the redeeming action for humans. Humans could do nothing to earn salvation. That came entirely from God's grace. While Calvin was scoring triumphs at Worms, word reached him that Geneva was interested in having him back. In October and November of 1541, Genevan officials wrote to Strasbourg, asking if Calvin could be released from any preaching responsibilities there and return home. The timing could not have been better. For Calvin and Melanchthon, who was also present at Worms, were growing increasingly uneasy with Martin Bucer. Bucer, they felt, was being a bit too friendly with the Catholics. They believed he was willing to compromise anything to heal the schism and seek reform through the Roman Church, which both Calvin and Melanchthon now saw as an impossibility. Calvin owed a lot to Bucer, but now it was time for them to part company. Next week, Calvin returns to Geneva more confident in his abilities and with the skills needed to put his reformation into practice. As always, if you're interested in more content, check out the website, westernsibpodcast.com, link in the show notes, or consider becoming a patron at patreon.com forward slash westernsibpodcast, link also in the show notes. Western Civ actually recently made a top 25 ancient history podcast list. So a little bit of accolades for us after all. Link in the show notes if you want to check out the full list. Until next time.